on Thursday, I was lucky enough to go and see Jordan Peterson live for one of his 12 Rules for Life lectures in my hometown of Manchester. The lecture was fairly good. I'm going to go through it myself and give my thoughts on it as well. It was basically Dave Rubin introducing him for 10 minutes, John Peterson talking for an hour and a half, which was very gripping, and it didn't feel like an hour and a half. It felt a lot quicker. And then at the end, they had about half an hour, 40 minutes to answer questions. And me and my friend had both our questions answered out of the three that they decided to answer, which I thought was really cool. But there's no point waiting around, so I'll just go through some of the things he said in the lecture. So, as I said, Dave Rubin was on introducing him, doing the lobster jokes and other memes, explaining the intellectual dark web, and explaining some of the hit pieces, mainly enforced monogamy, which he basically just described in a word, he meant marriage. So, <laughs> that was all the introduction Jordan Peterson needed, at least for me. I don't think it really informed my friend or... I, my mum was there as well, actually. <laughs> she didn't entirely get all the jokes, but it was fairly obvious to her that a lot of it was in jokes, but she was there more for the lecture anyway, so that didn't really matter. So Jordan Peterson enters, and he led by mentioning that he had a conversation at a quite a famous boxing club in Manchester. It's a boxing club in Moss Side, and if you don't know Moss Side, it is probably the scummiest place on earth. It really is pretty bad. I mean, gangs operating everywhere and all that. So someone set up a boxing club for kids to go and basically have good male role models and learn some discipline. And so John Peterson was there earlier that day to have a conversation recorded by the BBC with other random people. And his whole lecture just revolved around that. And the rules he was mainly going through were Rule 11, don't bother kids while they're skateboarding. Rule 10, be precise in your speech. And Rule number 7, do what is meaningful and not what is expedient. And he really nailed these home with all these examples and all the people he was talking to. It really was kind of this one-off type lecture that I don't think you'll get anywhere else. Hence, I'm making the video explaining it all. So in this conversation at the boxing club, one of the participants of the conversation, when he was younger, joined a gang. And <laughs> John was like, now this may sound bad, but actually being able to join a gang is a good thing. Because it basically shows that at least you can socialise even with if it's with a bad crowd. It, you know, if you can't, if you don't have the opportunity to join a gang, then it kind of shows that you can't deal with people. Uh, it made out for interesting gang dynamics because obviously it's kind of a anarchistic hierarchy, if that makes sense. There's no real, I mean, there are rules, but man, it's it's not like it's not the rules that society is used to in a civilised sense so it's just crazy so this guy did make the boxing club because he had experience with gangs managed to get himself together and realized right this isn't a good thing for young people to be in gangs so i'm going to if they're going to be a part of something they may as well be a part of something that's meaningful so a boxing club is good because these kids get scouted all the time because they are super aggressive obviously and if they can pinpoint that into you know boxing and then turn out to be really good at it, they can end up as, like, boxing champions, like, locally, if anything else, but, you know, that's pretty good, because they can earn a lot of money for that. Uh, and as Peterson was going on about how gangs worked, I kind of got the feeling that he more meant just a friendship group where you get up to no good. That seemed to be what he meant by gang, or it can mean literal organised crime syndicates. So that seemed to be what he meant. So it's not like you had to, like, go to the worst neighbourhoods in Philadelphia to be able to socialise. I don't think that's what he meant, but that's the that's sometimes the problem with Jordan Peterson. You have to kind of work out what he's saying rather than him just saying it. I think Noel Plum made a video about that if you want to go see it. But while going on about gangs, he explained that it's better to be in a gang and be tough than be recluse at home and weak, obviously, because... And then he goes into the problem with the weakness is that even if, if you are weak and you still overcome something odds are if you're weak you're going to be very bitter about even having to overcome something so that's why it's always better to be tough even if it's in a heavy-handed sort of way where it damages people because at least that's easier to control than your bitterness and then after that he mentions the crisis of young men and he really doesn't like that term the crisis of masculinity he doesn't think it's a crisis of masculinity because he brings up Road to Wigan Pier, like, 
uh, 70 years ago in the 1930s when we had coal mines like <laughs> he was saying like George Orwell was a pretty tough guy because he was um he was born in India and had to like travel a lot and I, th I think he was he did something in the empire anyway but when he was researching the working class in the in the northern towns he tried to go through like a daily commute for a just an average mine worker and he had to crawl three miles in like a tiny space in the mines and he got about a mile down and he's just like no i'm turning back <laughs> he couldn't hack it whereas people in the between 20 and 30 were going down and trying to dig up all the coal they could get while they were down there and they'd end up with black lung by about 31 i mean that sounds pretty horrible to what i have to deal with now i mean i have enough time to go on the internet and talk crap about politics and like it's hardly a crisis is it but i mean oh just just sounds awful whereas you compare it to today's problems where hate crime in scotland is a thing <laughs> <laughs> and then he goes on about how this is mainly because the humanities have said that Western culture is a, pa a patriarchal tyranny, which he obviously says is wrong if you've ever heard him before. Uh, he th generally thinks this is because we have to generally personify the world, and they've just only applied the tyrannical, you know, the tyrannical brother in Scar from The Lion King. He says that's probably what people are thinking of when they think of western civilization and they can't really understand why because we're in a big civilized space where everyone understands the rules we're listening to jordan peterson no one's really heckling beyond what they what is expected and we're in an auditorium that's made out of concrete and not radioactive sand like the ussr made their auditoriums out of because it was a good way to get rid of radioactive sand but the reason we personify the world is because we're social creatures at heart and we actually find it hard to actually objectively see anything because we have to put something that's already known to us we have to project that on something to help us understand it and male personifies society basically because it represents hierarchy both a tyrant and a wise king so the king from the lion king and sky is evil brother who's envious basically and so because it can be both the wise king and the tyrant, it can corrupt because it's basically a big hierarchy and hierarchies are corruptible. And the other thing about them being corruptible is that generally, if they constantly change and adapt to their environment, they won't be as easily corrupted. Because if you have to change something, you can't, you know, things that have been in place for a long time are more easily corrupt is essentially what he was saying. And so because of that, <laughs> he then moves on to explain it in business generally businesses we have today haven't really lasted more than a generation if the management hasn't completely changed as society has completely changed especially over the last 10 years uh, and that's because one that hierarchy will get corrupt and two it's trying to like provide goods and services that are out of date basically i mean you look at you know apple like their company has completely changed over the years they used to just you know bring out macs and alternatives to pcs and now they're coming out with smartphones without headphone jacks because <laughs> they're constantly adapting to what they think the market wants and it's hardly corruptible because of that it's corrupted by social justice kind of i don't I, apple's not too bad actually but other ones are mainly because of the humanities and they're a very very loud voice but they are very very small minority really but he explains that sure this makes like rich people but the thing is the world is so good that you know things that cost a well, things you couldn't even buy with money a hundred years ago you are perfectly safe from and he used the example of like rockefeller in the 1910s his uh one of his sons died of like a really easily preventable disease that's completely free of charge in most countries because vaccinations are free and he's like yeah like money doesn't even buy that now but you know, years ago, Muddy didn't buy this uh, Rockefeller's son's safety. So, like, I don't know what you're complaining about. <laughs> He's basically saying. And he also mentions that, like, yeah, sure, the rich buy the great things first. But them doing that is investing in the company, which can then make the great things cheaper. I mean, you know, say the space race today. Like, they're all done by really, really rich uh, people like Richard Branson and Elon Musk. Uh, but that's because... 
they have to pay for it first to try and find the cheapest way to make these things so that then everyone else can you know buy their way to space so to speak and while he was on the subject of the rich people buying things first he brings up how people are envious of the one percent but if you look at worldwide standards to be the one percent you have to be earning at least 36 thousand dollars or something like that which is just crazy because that's basically everyone in the western world so everyone in the western world is the one percent and we're buying the things first before everyone else so we are in a really good place and trying to destroy that isn't a good idea he also mentions that democracy is generally very good at avoiding corruption up in the uh, higher echelons of society so to speak <laughs> and he mentions that the americans were essentially Englishmen plus because they were the Americans which is true by the way the Americans were basically people who felt oppressed by the higher echelons of society so seceded made their own better version of England and I have to say with their constitution I can't help but agree and so after explaining all that for about 20 minutes he basically just boils it down to the radical left are just completely ignorant of history which is something that I've mentioned a lot in these videos I make but he also comes around to bringing around another point, and that is the modern crisis isn't really about masculinity, it's about psychology. And he basically, I think he was trying to point out that really we're punishing men for things they're doing well now. Because, I, so say, basically whenever a woman gets into a position of power in this tyrannical patriarchy, it's an okay thing. Like, that's a good thing, in fact. But when it's men doing the good, exact same good thing then they're terrible patriarchal oppressors. So he seems to think that it's Nietzsche's, you know, type of if you want to punish someone, do it when they've done something good, and that will really hurt them. So it seems to be some type of envy from the radical leftist feminists. That seems to be what he was trying to point out. Because there's no way that their version of reality about the tyrannical patriarchy is true, because of history, basically. He also says it can't just be a crisis of masculinity, because you can't have a crisis of one gender. Because, for instance, if you have a crisis in men, then you'll start seeing women also having a crisis. And apparently we found that, basically, as as this crisis in masculinity, quote-unquote, has been going on, women have wanted marriages more and more. And that's inverse to what men want. <laughs> so that's made a bit of a problem for women, and it's made other problems for women. Because, you know, look at all the soy boys. They're, they hardly take up any type of responsibility, and, you know, them. They're not really doing anything with their lives so that we can see, or anything good. Uh, that's that's not what he said, that's my own kind of interpretation of it. But he then goes on about PC culture, and PC culture basically comes out of about 8% of the people in society. About 8% of the people describe themselves as far left, and out of that 8%, about 30% of them still think political correctness has gone too far. And he was also going on about these stats as well, saying that, like, white people are the people that least think that political correctness has gone too far. And that means minorities, the people that political correctness is supposed to be helping, are the type of people most dissatisfied because political correctness has gone too far. And he just thought, this just shows that, like, they, they're just completely rejecting reality, which they are. <laughs> he described it more as then wanted to have their cake and eat it because the people who want political correctness generally are people who earn over a hundred thousand dollars a year uh are white <laughs> and are generally well they're generally it doesn't really matter about their gender they're generally 50 50 but these people are basically the most privileged people in society due to their wealth so they've got their cake with being super rich but they're also trying to eat it too by leading the poor against this big tyrannical patriarchy. They're basically LARPing douchebags. <laughs> I mean, you see these Antifa people. You know, you see these pictures of Antifa people, and they have expensive equipment on them. I mean, they clearly have a lot of money and time to waste. I mean, they're not, going, they're not the type of people who go down mines for, you know, four-hour commutes crawling down a tunnel. Like, these people have everything. It's ridiculous. He then made a joke that... Uh, the best way to actually rid ourselves of radical leftist sociologists is just to quadruple their pay because they absolutely hate the super rich. So doing this would make them the super rich. <laughs> and it's either that or they'll end up feeling that they've got what they deserve. 
And so therefore they won't keep trying to push this radical leftist ideology to try and make them feel good, at, you know, to virtue signal themselves that they're doing good for the poor and minorities. So he thinks that basically if you just make them really rich, they'll go away. But uh, I don't really want to do that because our ideas are terrible. And I, you know, why would anyone does like why does anyone deserve to be paid for annoying society? Because most people think political correctness has gone too far. I mean, it's ridiculous that we still have it, to be honest. He then moves on back to the patriarchy and basically says, well, not that it's caused by men, but it, it just looks like it was mainly men, you know, making decisions in society because, well, it's not that women weren't doing anything. It's not like the first woman to do anything was Jermaine Greer in the 1960s, as he put it. The problem was, was that like, a lot, because obviously they had to, they didn't have any like real birth control. They basically had, if they had their first kid, they'd end up at home looking after the kid because obviously they have to breastfeed it and, you know, you know, natural biology. But then also while they were there, they had to, they basically had to do something. So it took like three hours to do the washing. And in the 1930s, they wouldn't even do the washing properly because, I mean, your husband's just going to go down the mine again and get really, really dirty coaly stuff all over their shirt again so basically women didn't have an awful lot of time on their hands until the birth control came about which was made by men by the way and this absolutely revolutionized human behavior essentially a different species according to him because now women have complete control of when their maternal instincts actually affect them to want a baby that's basically all he was saying but um <clears throat> he then went on to say that <laughs> he said that he's stating this biological fact which he said was damn right near illegal in this country which is true because he was basically saying women marry across and up hierarchies which i'm sure is common knowledge to most people uh and that's basically because <laughs> well you know if you're gonna have to spend your life with someone it may as well be someone competent and women tend to prefer having someone be responsible for the one you know doing that sort of thing and so because women got picky, they needed to determine which men were like the most responsible or best for them. And so they basically wanted hierarchies to come along to then sort the men out into who was the most competent, quote unquote, because he, he does constantly say Western civilization is based on competence, which is generally true until he until he starts talking about Justin Trudeau, because <laughs> he absolutely hates the man. But um, he then compared to the modern like if you don't let your kids skateboard your kids will end up like fat cats you know they won't do any damage they'll just sit on a radiator all day and if you feed it it won't cause any trouble and then that's all you have i mean do you really want that does anyone want that i think you want a strong and competent partner and that's why you look at someone in a hierarchy to determine who is the most competent and responsible and who you don't want to end up marrying he mentions the wage gap and that it's basically a wage gap between mothers and all that because, well, mothers take a massive economic hit by having a child because it's basically an investment of absolutely everything. You know, your your, uh, your money, your time, your energy, really, into having this kid and they don't pay anything off until they're about 25. And he said, like, look, you've got to realise that, like, investors are going to want tenfold on their money within the year. And if you have a kid that does basically the inverse of that, like, then obviously, it's obviously a bad investment, but it's a good investment for everything else that isn't to do with money. And he's like, well, that's sort of where meaning comes from, especially for women. And it's like, well, obviously. I mean, he just talks sense through most of this. I can't believe people hate him. But the hierarchy is also sorted out by people making risks and mistakes, and that helps people other people or that same person climb up that hierarchy by learning the best way to be responsible and competent and that's how we basically end up with good men and women which makes sense to me and that was pretty much where he ended his lecture segment and he moved on to his questions which i will go through because i thought they were some two very good questions i have to say <laughs> so first was my friend's question and that was will the joe rogan podcast be cited in 50 years by academics and uh, to give you the long and short of it, yeah, probably it's already a really reliable source because basically it's just people having long form conversations and it's completely uncensored. So you can source anything from there and you know it will be 100% accurate because anyone can go back and check it 
And also, it's just the person directly talking their mind, because it's a real conversation. I mean, sure, it's three hours long, but my God, they are good. He then moved on to say that, well, in 50 years, we don't even know if we'll have to bother citing anything, because if you look at robots from Boston Dynamics, we're already making robots that can basically parkour. <laughs> and so, if they are intelligent enough to do that, you know, in 50 years, they'll probably be more intelligent than we can comprehend, so we might not even need to bother citing things, but that's a whole different question altogether. But that was pretty much his answer anyway. The next question was my question, and my question was, uh, the MEP in the EU who uh, was forced to apologise after calling the Nazis socialist, I asked, generally, were the Nazis socialist and should he have apologised? Now, although Peterson didn't actually answer my question of whether he should have apologised, I think I can already infer the answer from Peterson's actual answer. And the long and short of it was, basically, well, the Nazis called themselves socialist, and they did that for a number of reasons. We know that they had socialist policies in their manifestos, but the problem comes in is that, well, we don't really know if they were left or right wing. And the reason we don't know that is because we can't do the research properly, because it's really hard to get research like this done at universities because of their left wing bias. But basically his idea was that we should make a survey of policies, have it as communist policies and Nazi policies, get rid of the stuff that was made it obvious which one was which. So, you know, it'd be like, from the Nazi side, it'd be sort of like you know, workers' warehouses should be like owned by the government and distri distributed like you know, however, because uh, that's what the Nazis did. And um, <laughs> I just we can't like then we'd be able to determine from people saying they're left and right wing whether these policies are left and right wing. But no one can do that because the money you have to get from universities to actually fund something like that is quite large, and they're never going to do it because if it turns out Nazis are in any way left wing that ruins their bloody narrative for the last 50 years that nazis are right wing so i think what he was generally saying is that yes obviously the nazis were socialist and i think i can take infer from him that basically the guy shouldn't have apologized because he told the damn truth and you don't apologize for telling the damn truth but the final question i, I don't know who this question was from because obviously every question was from a randomer it just happened that mine and my friends were the first two asked. But the third question was, this guy was a high intelligence course, and he felt like he was overly conscious, so to speak. He was just hyper aware of the world. And he asked, should he just reclude himself a bit and kind of be a bit more, you know, ignorant of the world to feel happier? And Jordan Peterson's basic answer was, no, obviously not, because life is going to be difficult no matter what you do, and if you're blissfully unaware of it, you can't improve yourself, obviously. So go out. It's going to be difficult, but go out there. Really try and change the world however you can, uh, mainly through your own individual life and actions. And sure, being intelligent's a burden, but, I mean, the greatest minds in the world were intelligent, and they probably would have rather been done doing something better, uh, more in instantly gratifying, but... In the end, it's about your responsibility. And your responsibility as an intelligent person is to do something great with your life. Don't just recluse. But that was it. So all in all, I thought it was a very, very good lecture. I really would have... I really recommend people go to them because he really does just bring in stories from everywhere, really. And it manages to all neatly tie it together with, uh, you know, don't bother kids when they're skateboarding. You know, go let them join a gang. Be precise in your speech. Well, the crisis of masculinity isn't very precise. I mean, it can mean a lot of things. So if we're going to talk about a crisis, let's talk about the actual problems and not just try and say that men are in a bad way. Because men, it's not just men in a bad way. It's every, it's the whole of humanity is always in a bad way. So be precise about what problems we want to fix because not doing that is going to cause a lot more problems. And finally, do what is meaningful and not what is expedient. Well, being in a gang is easy because it's quick money, whatever. It's just, it's not doing anything good for humanity, is it, really? So if you go off and be part of a boxing club and really put yourself in order, you can inspire other people to do that. And that is very meaningful to those boys, it seems. But I'm looking forward to John Peterson coming through the UK doing all his interviews again, because honestly, I cannot wait to hear him go on to all these shows and change people's minds again and just... 
absolutely tear down some of the questions he's asked. It's amazing. But well, until then, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you later.